Hi, everybody. Um, I think it's important when you have a tough problem to try a new angle uh, rather than plugging along at something that doesn't work all the time. And nowhere is this more evident than the trying to make vaccines for what we call vaccine-resistant pathogens. And so you've heard them all. You've heard of uh, common cold and HIV and these others. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And so over the years, humans have been infected with lots of different kinds of pathogens, and, um, and some of them have been very deadly. So for example, in the 1300s, there was a pandemic of plague in Europe, and it killed 25 million people, which was a lot of people then. And then in the last century, smallpox killed 300 million people in the, in the world. Um, since then, we've uh, co uh, come to terms with what the difference is between the different pathogens, that pathogens cause disease, and that flowed through that so that we could make vaccines and other methods to protect ourselves. Um, and so um, in the past uh, 100 years or so, vaccine technology has really accelerated. So in the 1900s, um, a bunch of vaccines were made. And so now we have vaccines for about 30 pathogens, human pathogens. And this has been a great lifesaver, especially for children in this country and other countries. Um, but for every pathogen that we have a vaccine for, there's many, many more where we don't have any, pathogen, any vaccine at all. And what I want to talk to today is that how, it, how is it that we have pathogens, I mean, excuse me, vaccines for some of these bugs, but not others? What is the difference between one and the other? And, and most of the time, vaccinologists think about the pathogen. Oh, this one has a lot of variability. That one induces the wrong immune response. And this is how we blame our failure to get this done. But what I wanted to do today was change this around, look at it from a little different perspective, and look at ourselves. You know, we have a lot to do with how vaccines work because we have an immune system that's going to protect us from being infected or reinfected. And so what is it in about our immune system that plays along with this that results in vaccine failure? Well, let's talk about influenza. Everybody knows about the flu. So there was a Spanish flu, 1918, uh, and then that killed like 50 million people around the, uh, around the world. It was a huge, huge pandemic. Since then, we've had lots of other pandemics. And in the middle of the last century, uh, some vaccines were developed. And now we have flu vaccines that most of us get. And that prevents a lot of deaths and sicknesses from the flu. And what happens is that people make us educated guess at what's going to be the next circulating virus or strain. And then you put that into the flu vaccine, stick it in someone's arm, and, uh, and it works pretty well a lot of times. Well, sometimes it doesn't work very well because we're surprised. So recently, we were very surprised in 2009 with this so-called swine reassorted H1 virus. And that infected about a billion people on the planet, probably more than that, maybe a billion and a half. Well, this was a pretty mild virus uh, in terms of pathogenesis. If it had been as big a killer as, this, uh, as the Spanish flu in 1918, things would have been much, much worse. So um, if we have been able to make vaccines against measles, mumps, and rubella, how come we can't make a good vaccine against the common cold, HIV, and the flu? Well, I think that there are two major barriers. And the first one is the one we always talk about, and that is some viruses vary. Okay, you have lots of different strains of the flu, or you have uh, flu that uh, morphs or evolves into something else, or reassorts, and so now it's avoided immunity. But I think, well, really the biggest problem is not the virus, it's us. Our immune system preferentially recognizes these variable sites instead of the sites that are common to all. So one of the terms I wanted to talk about today are epitopes. Epitopes are sites on a protein or pathogen that our immune system sees and responds to. In the case of measles, mumps, and rubella, dominant epitopes generate really good protective res responses. And 50 years later, you can get exposed and not get infected. So that's a great uh, example of a dominant epitope. However, with uh, measles, uh, with, excuse me, with, um, with flu and HIV and the common cold, those dominant epitopes are not in constant spots. They're in places that are variable. And so we make an immune response to a moving target. And uh, what can we do about that? So um, in a way, these moving targets, these bad epitopes, are like decoys. And so we're all familiar with lots of kinds of decoys. Um, so uh, when bombers detect um, missile launches or painted with, with uh, radar or something, they can uh, launch large amounts of chaff and decay, t decoy their positions. Once they do that, the missiles, whoop, the radar surveillance gets, uh, gets uh, confused. And the missiles miss their target. Well, this is the structure of the um, target for the vaccine for, HI, for uh, influenza 
And this is a hemagglutinin protein, so actually a trimer, and it looks, uh, it looks fairly easy to do something with, with an antibody, lots of sites to bind. Unfortunately, if you colorize it like what I have here, um, with all the sites that vary each year or over time, you find that the common sites are lost between this noise of color. And there are certainly some common sites there, and we have antibodies that can neutralize almost every virus through the common sites, but we just don't make those antibodies. So is there some way, is there some method we can come up with to understand this better? So let's pretend that these volleyballs are in fact influenza viruses. The first one on the left has an A on it, and then we have a B and a C. So if you're infected with the A volleyball, you make a response to the A that is strain restricted to that A. So if you get immunized with the A virus last year and the B virus last week, you can still get infected with the C virus today. And this is because the dominant epitopes are in variable sites. So <clears throat> is there something we can do about that? Well, my colleagues and I at Biological Memetics in Frederick, Maryland, have developed this technology that we call the immune refocusing technology. It really has two parts. The first part is, one, identify the problem. Find out where the decoys are. And so we've examined hundreds of thousands of, of viruses and structures and antibodies, and we think we can now identify these kind of decoys that are the bad players. Then we try to um, dampen these decoys while preserving the overall structure. And so we have turned down the heat on these uh, decoys, and now hopefully uh, we can make vaccine candidates that recognize the common sites that are more protective. In essence, what we've done is we've erased the A's and B's and C's on these stickers, and now the three volleyballs look pretty much the same because there's lots of sites that are common. So I'm going to give you three examples where we've tried to tone down these, uh, these decoys. Um, and the first one was, is uh, HIV. So this is a drawing of HIV. As you can see, it's coated with uh, envelope protein. These are GP160s. And GP160 binds cells. And that's how you can start an infection. And therefore, um, that is the primary target for our immune response uh, for protection, at least so we think. The problem is, like I've alluded to earlier with the A's and B's and C's, we see do dominant epitopes that are strain restricted in these loops. And so our antibodies or any kind of immune uh, response we make is only strain restricted, and then the virus can evolve away from it, and then we're unprotected. So but to look at that, you can immunize animals with uh, the unmodified GP120, and in this case is from one strain. And you'd see that the antibodies have good neutralization of, uh, we're going to measure that at 126. Uh, neutralization titer uh, to that same strain. But if you take that same sera and try and neutralize another strain, it has no neutralizing activity at all, less than, a, less than detected. However, if you take that same uh, molecule and put an immune refocused mutation in one of those decoy sites, you can now see neutralization against that second, uh, that second strain. And if you target another site, the second site, now you have two immune refocused mutations. Now you can start to get somewhere where you're getting uh, much better uh, neutralization activities. And hopefully this would prevent infection or combat the virus. It used to be thought that these little pieces, these epitopes, these hot epitopes, the decoys, um, were the primary means for which we'd be protected. And some, uh, most people thought that a good vaccine would contain these sites, or a better vaccine would contain a bunch of these sites strung together. So we now know that our, um, the virus can rapidly escape from immune pressure to those sites. And so maybe we're really better off without them. Like HIV, flu also is covered with envelopes, uh, spikes. And these are called hemagglutinin for the envelope, or the HA. And immunization uh, uh, with, uh, with a, a HA from one strain, in this case the Wyoming strain of virus, creates neutralizing antibodies that neutralize that same virus pretty well. But it uh, doesn't neutralize the other viruses as well. And as you can see, these viruses evolved later. The little numbers after them, Wyoming started in 2003. And then we have a Brisbane in 2006 and another one in 2007. And so <clears throat> we introduced an immune refocusing mutation in one site of one of the major decoys. And what we were surprised to find was such great immune response to that same uh, strain one virus, that Wyoming virus. But even more importantly, we had really good neutralizing responses to the, these two Brisbane uh, strains that uh, evolved much later. And so um, 
We've grown, we seem to have grown accustomed to losing 30 or 35,000 people a year in this country to flu. And that's when the vaccine works pretty well. In some years, like in 2007, the vaccine didn't work very well at all because this Brisbane virus came up and surprised us. And more than twice as many people died. I don't really think that's an acceptable uh, a way to, to have a vaccine. And so I think that it behooves us to think outside the box a little bit. How, uh, rather than focusing on how, what the next strain of virus is, let's focus on a different perspective and see if we can improve vaccines by focusing on how we react to the pathogen or the, the vaccine. So in one other example, a friend of mine and colleague in Taiwan uh, did a similar experiment with an avian influenza, an H5 virus. And this is a kind of really bad killer virus that can uh, do a lot of damage. It's probably just as bad as the Spanish flu of 19, uh, 1918. And so what he did was he immunized animals and found that, sure enough, um, if you immunize with strain one, you get neutralizing titers of 1 to 900 against that strain one, but no neutralizing titers against the strain two. Adding a, 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 an immune-focused mutation into the major decoy epitope allowed him to retain the neutralizing titers against the strain one, but also greatly increased the titers to the strain two. Now, I don't know if we're going to have a, a, um, a um, pandemic virus that's going to be a big killer like 1918 anytime soon, but we are concerned that this could happen. And our government has, has uh, put forth uh, millions and millions of dollars to try and combat this. And what the solution has been is to stockpile virus uh, vaccines for future pandemics. Since we know that these vaccines are made using native sequences that haven't been changed, we also pr are pretty sure that they'll make strain-restricted immunity. So we'll have uh, millions of vaccines on the shelf that, without any guarantee that will protect us. What I'm saying is maybe we should think outside the box, change our perspective to our immune system, and put some immune-refocusing mutations in there, and perhaps uh, make, better, make better vaccines that will give improved protection. Um, I think I've talked here a little bit. The example has been the vaccines, but I think that you, in every day, everyone's daily life, you come across these problems and you can't solve them. You keep working on it. So I think that the major take home message from today, uh, and everyone's talked today, is if you can look at it from a slightly different point of view and be agile enough to accept changes in, uh, uh, and different and new information, then perhaps we can solve our problems. Thank you.